think I'm in the category of make things happen, not the policy group. So, uh, hey, good morning, everybody. Boy, that was kind of soft. Came all the way, you know, it's great to be out of Washington, D.C. This is, uh, grew up on the West Coast. It's always great to be back on the West Coast. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to have this opportunity to talk to you today. So uh, Vice Admiral Daly, uh, thank you for that warm introduction. and. A little bit before uh, the remarks this morning, I had a chance to go back and visit some of the, the booths and ran into a number of uh, former colleagues and, and friends. And it's just uh, good to be able to rub elbows with uh, industry. Spent 30 years doing that. It's kind of fun to be back in, in that forum. And maybe just as a preface to my remarks, a big thank you to the US Naval Institute, AFSIA, for hosting this, this wonderful venue. I have a bad habit of trying to put together my own remarks. And so uh, this weekend, I was doing a little bit of research on, on this venue and the program. And I would uh, just have to offer, I'm a little bit jealous. You know, it looks like the, the subjects and the, the discussions are very similar to the ones that we're having in the Pentagon. Uh, the quality of the speakers, the, the quality of the companies that are represented here are quite high. You know, so I think in terms of investment of your time and your money, this is a very powerful forum. And then, as we all know, it's the network that you create that's so valuable. So it's a real pleasure to be here to help kick off uh, this year's event. And then, uh, you know, when I, when I think of, of coming out here, it's really a chance for me to, you know, do more than you know, talk about the usual things. But, you know, for me and my assignment, it's to get my my voice. And I think Admiral Daly was talking about the traditional role of a, a Deputy Secretary of Defense. And you know, I may, to some extent, play a, a non-traditional role. But the first six months have been fantastic. I started on July 19th. I've been in the building for six months. I've not uh, spent a lot of time doing uh, travel, as the primary purpose was to make sure we could put together a national defense strategy and then a budget that was derived from that. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more. Um, Secretary Mass, I've had six months to work with him. That's been incredible. Six months of working with the chairman and the vice and the service secretaries and the, and the service chiefs. You should know it's a really strong team. The spirit, the energy, the collective will to compete and win is extraordinary. And, in my career, I haven't had uh, the chance to work on such a strong team, so I'm very encouraged just in the first six months. Uh, part of today's discussion or dialogue is how do we get all of you more engaged, because really that's the nature of, of winning. The, uh, for those that, that know me, I have this expression, uh, PowerPoint is the enemy of thought. But I've violated my own rules, so I put five five together just because sometimes just reading a speech isn't that exciting for the people who have paid a lot of money to be here. And those five are really two that I think characterize, I'll say, context of the environment that we're working in today in the Pentagon. And a little bit of my discussion here is to give you kind of a sense of uh, how we're thinking, what we're doing, because I know in uh, my years in industry, it was always hard. you know. What are they thinking? What do they want? What do we need to do? We all want to be successful in where we're spending our money or how we're using our time. Could you throw us a few scraps? You know, and today I hope to give you more than a few scraps, but um, some insight into what we're doing, where we're going, and how fast we want to move. The uh, other, other maybe uh, message behind that is we're really as much about implementation as anything, and that. Uh, when the collective we, meaning government and industry, are aligned, we have a history of dominating. So I want to do uh, an informal poll here. Uh, this is a little audience participation. How many of you think Secretary Mattis is doing a good job? Show of hands. All right, that's good. OK. How many of you think he could do a better job? Oh, there's one hand. There's a couple. OK, all right. Um, why don't we get together after? We can have a little, little discussion. I've, I've brought some friends with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, I've been real fortunate to uh, witness 
probably six months of, uh, or five months of his time in 2017. And I want to maybe just talk about 2017 for a, a moment and the, the performance of uh, the secretary and, you know, I'll say collectively the, the team here in DOD. So if I can go to the next slide here. Um, you know, the, the, the short story is, besides it being a complex environment, imagine the concurrency that's going on inside the building right now. Uh, standing up a team, you're the secretary, standing up a whole new team. And then you have the ISIS campaign. You have the, uh, the, the new President Trump's new South Asia uh, strategy to win in Afghanistan. More than any other time in history in terms of natural disasters, I think the number is over $300 billion. A, uh, a North Korean situation in which 23 missiles have been launched in the last year and 16 tests. I mean, you can kind of read down the list. It's been a very, very dynamic environment. It would have been so easy to take a pass on the strategy this year because of all the activities and all the turmoil and all the change that's going on in the building. And just to throw, just to make it a little spicier and more fun, in the fourth quarter of 2017, we were under a CR, so we had to operate at 10% below our FY18 uh, president's request. So all of that was going on, and simultaneously, we put together the national defense strategy. And the inside, the inside baseball part of that is, it was a well-coordinated whole of government effort. You know, from the outside, you often hear about the, the bureaucracy and the pace and some of the inefficiency of coordinating across agencies. I'm here to tell you that that did not happen. The, uh, uh, the department was well-coordinated with the National Security Council, the national security strategy that the president drove. We were hand in glove in aligning the, not just, you know, when you think about aligning, sometimes it's making the words match. We're talking about integrating the policy so that it's complementary, that it really prioritizes what's required for the defense of the nation. And concurrent to that, we're working with the State Department so that the product that hopefully many of you have read by now, the unclassified version, which is 11 pages, is the result of a sprint to put together a strategy that would build a budget. And the budget, starting in about August, had to be hand massaged top down so that it was really derived from the strategy. I'm quite proud of the work uh, that's been done. I was sharing with a few others that the secretary has this, I want to call it uh, intensity, and he applies Jesuit level rigor to any of the work that we take to his office. And he literally reads every, every word. Uh, the national defense strategy is, is his strategy. The department put it together, but it has uh, his fingerprints and we're all behind it to bring it home. And today I really want to talk about implementation. So we go to the next slide. This is the action that's going on behind the strategy. So if we distilled the 11 pages down to one page, it would be this one. And I'm, what I'm going to do in, in Providing some color here is not give you a blinding flash of the obvious, but if I had a yellow highlighter and I was highlighting certain words on the page, I would, I'm going to describe what those words really mean to us who are hard at work doing the implementation. So when you see the first uh, bullet there, long-term strategic competitions with China and Russia, we circle strategic and competition. And the reason we circle strategic, and this is from a leadership standpoint, is we've really tasked people to do, take a hard look at their calendar. If they're spending an hour a month on strategy, they're irrelevant. Leadership's job is to cast a long shadow. And if that shadow isn't focused on the strategy that we need to go implement, we will not achieve it. The second is competition. It's fun to watch the Super Bowl this weekend. I think there's a lot we can learn from professional sports, the level of uh, teamwork that occurs, and then the level of, of uh, competitiveness that occurs. We all hear about how our competitiveness has eroded. 
Our strategy is about how we sharpen and strengthen our competitiveness. And what I would ask everyone here in the room to think about is, you know, when you look at some place like the NFL, it used to be defense is one. Now it's offense. This has been a big, a big, a big shift. But that Doug Peterson nine years ago was teaching high school football or coaching high school football. And I think that's how we have to approach you know, our future. How do, how do we compete stronger and more effectively? It's, about, it's not about China, it's not about Russia, it's about competing. And there are no such things as fair competitions. There's just competition. The second bullet is about combat credible forward presence in Asia and Europe. And I would just highlight combat credible. And the real message to take from that is, let's not just acknowledge that we will operate in a contested environment. Let's embrace the fact that we'll operate in a contested environment. And that we, we understand how we can leverage capability, capacity, and geography, not to just get a uh, additive effect or a multiplicative effect, but how do we get an exponential effect from the combination. Sustainable missions in Middle East and Central Asia. Read supercharged policy and broadening and deepening our coalition partnerships. The most interesting one, I don't, I don't know uh, how all of you have read the, the document or the, or the work, but the, to me the, the biggest change in the national defense strategy is hidden in this, these words called dynamic force posture and, and employment. And it's really about how we'll be faster and how we'll make decisions about distributing resources differently than we do today. More about that later. The last two bullets really go together. And you know, being a, a good engineer, everything that engineers do is all about numbers. So that's why I'm Admiral Daly. I probably won't do well in that policy role. But in, in terms of objectivity, our focus really is around defining in the, I think the industry partners here understand this, but how do we put definition to lethality, resilience, and agility beyond you know, finding, finding ways to put them on the PowerPoint charts? They have criteria. And the, the reason I said the last two bullets go together is development, modernization, uh, providing new capability is not the enemy of cost. We must make our systems and products affordable. You know, I've lived in a world both commercial and, and defense. And in the commercial world, cost is much more dominant in decision making and in the design criteria. And I would just offer that our biggest opportunity is to be smarter and faster when it comes to the development of these programs and their affordability. So that's, that's the NDS on one page. Next slide. How's that look? Baseball? Good? You guys aren't, this is, this is like the best conference of the year, and you're, you're just, you're flat on me. I put, I worked hard on that baseball picture, even though, I mean, I'm from Seattle, and we don't have a baseball team. But, uh, all right, there we go, okay. All right. So I call this slide the DOD slide. And the DOD slide is, if you were to come to the Pentagon and follow a few of us around, and we were going to have a conversation of what the next six months looks like with regards to the national defense strategy. These are the three big levers uh, you would find me pulling on and the leadership. So the first one says strategy to action, active leadership. My uh, grew up with two brothers. My youngest brother has small business. And he always used to have this expression, you know, to make money, you have to work on the business and not in the business. I think, you know, this is back to the conversation about where we're spending our time. We in the building will be spending our time on the business, not in the business, you know, working on the, on the tactical side of the Pentagon or the Department of Defense. The one I'm most excited about 
is how we're going to implement change at scale. You know, we can run all sorts of little pilots, experiments, you know, demonstrate with, you know, 100 people, 200 people, 1,000 people that certain concepts work, but this is really about how do we affect change for millions and make it enduring. Put the, the comment, breaking the Gordian knot, that's how I, I view the, the Pentagon, is that it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful machine if you know how to make it work, and if you don't know how to make it work, it's a very complicated bureaucratic space. I think you, many of you know the legend of the Gordian knot where Alexander the Great, and I'm not Alexander the Great, I think maybe Secretary Mattis is, but I think the metaphor applies to the Pentagon. If we want to solve problems there, we need to break it into certain pieces that make it more manageable. And the three, three biggest pieces that we'll be working on, and I, I, I should probably preface these remarks by tomorrow morning about 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I'll be sitting with the chairman and the secretary, and we'll be signing off the implementation guidance that goes along with doing this. So from uh, you know, an industry standpoint, where you put together, put together schedules and processes, we did the strategy on time, we did the develop the budget on time, we're going to deliver the budget on time, we're going to have implementation guidance, defense planning guidance, financial guidance to go do these things so it's not uh, just talk. But the pieces that we're subdividing the Pentagon or the Department of Defense into really center on how do we be more joint. And the joint piece of this is, again, leveraging the joint staff, the speed element and the little my fancy graphic that I spent all of uh, 10 minutes putting together is a little calendar going to a clock for certain processes that relate to the deployment of resources. We're going to go from a month scale to a less than 24 hour scale. We're also, you know, and I, I'm hoping uh, this really is one of the, the bigger outputs is that prioritization of force development and force design is really going to be driven through the joint staff more so this year. So, you know, from where all of you sit, that prioritization, both on what we're going to do to achieve the national defense strategy is very important, but also there's a forced march on what are we not going to do, which is always, you know, the, you know, the elephant in the room. But that's the, the discipline and the commitment we're focused on. The vertical relates to the services. And I put the baseball example in place because it's always hard to describe this, but when you think about product development and player development in, in baseball, they're very similar. And, and I would argue, so you, know, you think about player development. You find a, a kid in, in high school, and this would be our case, we find someone who's six foot nine, can throw a curve ball with his left hand and his right hand, 100 miles an hour, and in our system, they would get to the big leagues when they were 30 or 40. So the issue isn't talent, it's development and the speed. So our focus with the services is really not do we not have the talent, money, it's we don't have the speed to do what you want us to do is integrate your product, products and services so that we have a balanced portfolio from S and T all the way till when we take programs out and retire them and put them in, in museums. We are out of balance. And we're also too slow. So if you said, Pat, where are you gonna spend a good majority of your time? I'll get to the details of that later. Getting the reforms going, but hopefully my biggest contribution will be, you know, no different than what all of us have done in our careers. How do we go faster with making programs more executable, get to market faster, have better cost structures, and are sustainable. The third piece really has to do with how do we scale new technology. We don't, we don't have a problem understanding the potential of innovation. We have a problem scaling it. And so this is really in a number of really critical areas how we're going to concentrate and scale technology. The uh, third bullet is I think the important piece, and that is, if everything is a change through a policy memo or you know, some paper document, the next person in the job gets to undo that. So everything 
that we're trying to do is make it so you can't go backwards. And so the piece you see there, uh, restructure, it's this emphasis on changing the structure. If we don't change, if there aren't enduring changes, none of this will stick. And I look at it in, in three areas. Reorganization and integration. Reorganizing is the easiest thing to do and the hardest to implement. So if you ask me on the top of my, you know, list, whoops, we got, we must have a uh, virus here. There we go. All right, you guys, it's okay. We got this. Um, but if you ask me, the the easiest tool people run to is to reorganize. But it's really more about how do we re-engineer, how do we change the work itself, and get more effectiveness. The, they have a term in the Pentagon, I've never heard this before, salami slicing, but I think all of you know what that is. It's really about we achieve efficiency by removing people. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a way to ensure increasing the risk, stressing people out, and keeping a lot of the old processes the same. So this is really more about what are we going to re-engineer. So the types of things, uh, intelligence, um, finance, there's a whole host of these that uh, you know, we've already initiated hard work on. And then the last part is, you know, technology is really the glue once you've done the good re-engineering that makes it stick and allows you to unlock more and more productivity. And we have a tremendous amount there in the Pentagon. And that's the two plus two equals seven. It's a, uh, it's a tremendous place. The, the workforce is remarkable. I have, uh, you know, transitioning in from industry, you don't know you know, exactly how receptive people will be to change. They desire, there's a, uh, a desire for leadership and direction. And once that direction is given, that's why the emphasis is so great on uh, top-down leadership. The, the teams, they take orders and they march. So we go to the next slide here. I thought I'd make a few comments on, on leadership. And this is, you know, where our, our heads are today. The first one, today's skills. You know, when I think back of when I came out of college and all the things I learned and I worked hard in the, you know, my first 10, 20 years at, at the Boeing company to hone, many of those skills aren't needed today to be successful. And so you get to a certain position and now you can either be a blocker or an enabler. And the, the mental model I have, and it's the one that we've been, helping the leadership to kind of think through. Remember this company called Kodak? Kodak was a company that was over 100 years old. They had 70% of the market share for film, and they invented the digital camera, and they went bankrupt. The leadership could not move from film to the digital camera. The innovation, the change was too great. Now, they had the people but the leadership didn't know how to make that switch. We're blessed when you look at the E1s to O3s in terms of the talent, the motivation, the professionalism. Our responsibility is to turn them, turn over to them an environment where they can flourish. And when you ask people about innovation, everybody says, oh, I want that. I want more of it. We need it. But when you actually are innovating, and those of you in in uh, industry know this, innovation is messy. And for those that have tight financial controls, no one likes things that are untidy. And so I think if we really want to make that transition to be more competitive in a contested environment and integrate novel new technologies that scale, we're gonna have to get comfortable with people making mistakes. I think we all believe that. It's amazing to watch how the organization looks to the leadership when that first person makes a mistake. So if we all run down and embrace them, pick them up, help them fall forward again, the organization gets turned on. If you don't, then everybody runs into the shadows, and that's the end of innovation. The third bullet is kind of a, a fun one. <clears throat> um, you can see on the bottom of the page there, there's this uh, lady, um, Vice Admiral Bono. She's the director of the Defense Health Agency, smiling there because she loves her job so much. She, uh, this, is, this is when people ask me, well, what are some of your perceptions being in the department? 
um, in, your, in your first few months. One of them is that we're risk imbalanced. And I'll use Admiral Bono as an example because we have so much opportunity when it comes to taking cost out of, I'll call it the back office, but you know, healthcare is not the back office, but it's non-military operations. And my comment about being risk imbalanced is every morning I get very detailed intelligence reports. And I see the risk our teams take downrange. It's extraordinary. And then I look at the work we're trying to do on reforms or take cost out or you know, change, you know, very straightforward things. Make changes that all of you in industry did 10 years ago. And the culture is, no, we don't want to take that risk. So we're more willing to take risk downrange, but not in these areas. Admiral Bono has the potential to integrate 390 clinics. All that money goes to, you know, in terms of, imagine if we integrated all of those, the quality of care, the delivery of care improves, and we all know from some of those standards, costs go down, but our foot's on the brake. You know, we want her to prove it to us. So, you know, again, I would, we have a lot of different leaders in this room, encourage the team to take the right kind of risk, and we can take more risk in the back office. Uh, by Wiven through, for those of you that did read the National Defense Strategy, a big emphasis is on how do we grow our relationships, especially with our partners and allies. Every one of us is in the relationship business. The uh, lesson I learned in, in this area a long time ago was really the part about everybody. It's not just business development. It's not just the State Department. So in this small airplane company I worked for up north, we would deliver airplanes all the time, and customers would come in to pick up these airplanes. Do you know who some of the best salespeople were? The Teamsters that would drive the customers around to pick up their airplanes. Those Teamsters were such advocates. In every touch, they were working to sell an airplane or some kind of you know, address a concern or an interest of a customer. All of us need to take that to heart. And the last one is really more, I'll, I'll put in the hygiene category. Uh, I'm guilty. I used to wear a Fitbit until this last week. Um, but in, in the NDS, it talks about being strategically predictable but operationally unpredictable. We leave digital footprints all over the place. I think our, our men and women with their cell phones, I'm, I'm guilty of myself. I mean, we just, as we start to think about you know, being operationally unpredictable. We'd hate to put into place all these other safeguards and capabilities and not have the common sense to keep from exposing ourselves. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the best one. Just some thoughts on uh, our industry partners. The, uh, the first one, and this is really meant to uh, ask you for some help, is also part of the message I've been working in the department. The vulnerability of cyber, I think we all understand this, is, is significant. You can imagine if, if tomorrow I sound, signed out a new, new memo, you know, Mike Petters from the Department of Defense, we, instead of having a financial disclosure statement, we want you to sign a cyber disclosure statement that says everybody you do business with is secure. I mean, I don't think you'd sign that tomorrow, but I mean, we, we need to get to that level because your secrets, our secrets are exposed. And the culture we need to get to is that we're gonna defend ourselves and that just like with security clearances or any time information is compromised, we want the bar to be so high that it becomes a condition of doing business. Um, we won't drop that safe on anyone's head right away, but that's where we want to get to. Okay? It's too important. Second one is, in the national defense strategy, is this emphasis on foreign military sales. The Department of Defense is open for business. I'm responsible for foreign military sales. We will be your advocate. I recognize there are 
number of problems and issues. I'm responsible for those, and we will work to Im improve those. The uh, place you can help all of us is, especially through the industry groups, um, stay honest, but help prioritize the, the changes we need to make. When I have put my fingers into a lot of this, it's you know a thousand different items, and we can make we can make substantial change, but helping us distill it into the critical ones has a lot of value. I won't belabor the affordability point. I think we all have an affordability problem. I think we uh, long term have to reduce the cost of defense. It takes time, but we're going to run out of time. And I'm, that's the part I worry about, because then we'll have to make really serious trades and get into this readiness versus modernization. We've got a window here where we can do both. And it starts with having the mindset that we have to be more affordable. And maybe to put it into context, when we think about affordability, I always think about affordability in terms of, this is back to the NFL, 40-yard dash. And so when somebody says, hey, I'm affordable, um, look, I've, I'm 10% you know, lower cost than I was before. It's more, to me, how fast do you run a 40-yard dash? If you're saying that you're running in six seconds, you're a wide receiver, then you're just not competitive. So when it comes to affordability, we really have to develop an understanding of what good is. My experience has always been, what should things cost? But there are a lot of different ways to go about this, but we have to get past uh, everything is measured in terms of improvement. We have to get to an absolute scale. This is what it should cost, and, and here's where we are. I spoke a little bit before about uh, performance. How do we really take this and make it quantitative? You know, is it still, it's still too qualitative, and I think, especially for the smaller companies, you lose on the margins because qualitatively we can't evaluate, and quantitatively we can't evaluate some of these effects, and that's just where we need more discipline and rigor. The, uh, not telling anyone anything new here, the military side of the industry, it's very slow. And that's why the big emphasis for us is speed. And then I'm just going to uh, plant this seed so we can get into some, some Q&A. The department shouldn't be setting standards. Industry should be setting standards. And you know, by that, I mean, you really need to come together. If I'm going to set standards, and if things or requirements are going to come out of JROCs, I think we're going to lag. You're on, the, you're on the front end, and you spend more time thinking about how technology is going to evolve. Our ability to have standards means we can integrate faster, we can have better means of testing, and we can you know, iterate in terms of integrating capability more quickly. So with that, I will uh, stop, because I think we're we're going to do a few uh, questions, but uh, maybe just in, in closing, very uh, confident and excited about the implementation of the National Defense Strategy. We have a fantastic team. I want to thank everybody for the work they do and uh, look forward to in interacting with all of you when we're back in Washington, D.C. So thank you very much. Sir, thank you. Uh, I was going to ask you about your role and how you see your role as a DepSec Def, but I think you told us you're going to be less of the traditional DepSec Def and more of the reform and implementation first. Yeah, let me, let me just a couple of, of comments there. So imagine if we drew a Venn diagram of uh, Secretary Mattis, you know, his like skills and background and, and history, and then just overlaid mine with his. At the very edge, they would touch. And it's because we're both from Washington State. And uh, the, uh, so the job interview I had with him, you know, there were a number of things that, that occurred there. But he said he wanted me to be the down and in person. And he's the up and out. So he does the White House, military operations, and you know, all the interaction with the, the allies and partners. And he's really tasked me with uh, uh, two major undertakings. The biggest one is modernization. So my, you know, most of, of my time and thinking goes into, well, it's really about lethality. How do we get the readiness and the modernization done concurrently? The reforms are a side job. 
but it's not a side job in terms of lower priority. Um, square, in, in, I feel, in my wheelhouse, so we'll, we'll get that up and running hard. The biggest opportunity for us is to modernize and to do it in such a way that we, you know, we avoid many of the missteps of the past. Is there a big aspect of modernizing, and you've already touched on this in your remarks, is the speed with which we act. And you mentioned the implementation guidance and going from a scale on resource decisions from 30 days is now 24 hours. And you mentioned a, a bigger role for the joint staff. Does that include all the aspects from identification of a requirement, R&D, acquisition to, uh, to the end state of uh, you know, buying a major piece of equipment? Do you see it all wrapped together, or how would that work? So, so the reference in time is to decisions on deploying forces. Okay. And so today it takes a certain amount of time, and we expect to do it in less than eight hours. And this isn't a study that we're going to do, you know, for many years. These are, you know, I sat down with the chairman. We're talking about months, not years. Got it. The, uh, the, the part in terms of, you know, JROCs and decision making, the <clears throat> I'm, and I'm pretty excited about this. I've had this, uh, you know, my, I've got a lot of new best friends, but probably my new best uh, friends is uh, the, the vice chair, General Selva. And the, the partnership there really is around, in terms of force design and force development, what is the priorities of those capabilities so that we get those joint effects. That doesn't mean we're divorced from how each of the services need to evolve their capability, but it really drives kind of the prioritization, which in this traditional role of, of leading the budget development, that's a chance where I can put my thumb on the scale. And that's the bonding we do. And that's part of the reason we've pushed to get the implementation guidance out early is that we'll do some heavy lifting in the Palm 20. So very early on, we're not just gonna let the process run itself. It's in some very critical areas how do we make those, how do we, in our deputies meeting, create a lot of tension? We like tension. And so that's really where, and the tension is, is it's what's been uh, very enjoyable there in the building is that people have wanted to have that kind of debate and, and dialogue, and that's, that's what you're seeing. Got it. Um, the National Defense Strategy mentions the eroding, the significant erosion of military advantage and of course, we have the budget coming out uh, in just a matter of days. Uh, the, the first memo that Secretary Mattis put out really emphasized readiness first. And some people are skeptical that we seem to be ratcheting over back into readiness and maybe not be ready. We may not be ready to embrace lethality and great power competition. What can you tell our audience about this budget? Is this going to embrace lethality and great power competition? Well, um, first thing I'd like to tell you is I want to get a FY18 budget first. That'd, that would be helpful. Um, yeah, there you go. The Secretary's up on the hill right now working it, so I uh, hopefully uh, by, I'm confident we'll get a budget, a budget or at least a CR this Thursday, and we're not going to shut down the government. But um, to answer your question about FY19, I'm, I'm bullish on the fact that, and this is why it goes back to the Gordian Knot comment, I think we can subdivide these problems and maintain focus. Uh, we can do readiness and modernization. I think what ends up happening is we defer a lot of the decision making and then we bow wave, bow wave risk. I, I'm, well, let's see, on my way out, stop by Colorado Springs. One of my kind of new hats that I wear is, you know, in the area of space. We have the capability and we have the resources and we have the skills to do what we need to do. Every time I look behind the curtain, I'm, I'm bullish. I, I, you know, I, this is, I think this is the other thing that's a little bit different for me working in the Department of Defense. We didn't talk about the other guy when I was in my old job. We talked about what we were going to do. And so I think what you're going to hear is not about what's eroding, but what's building, what we're strengthening, what we're sharpening. You know, the, uh, 
you know, the, the BCA caps, have, there's no question that they've been harmful. But you know, I'm the last person to, you know, I've met the men and women that, that serve. They're enormously capable. We, we need to help. They have a hard job that we just make harder. A big part of my job is to make it easier to unlock so much of that capability and to make it easier to do business with the Department of Defense. Well, certainly uh, talking about what we're going to do as job one makes us less reactive, and that's, that's an important step. Um, you know, you mentioned a couple times the people and how uh, impressed you were with the resources we have and even on the, the staff side. What steps are we going to take to take better advantage? You know, the competitive advantage takes many forms. How do we unlock and unleash our people and empower them better? And I'm not just talking about within the Pentagon, but all the way down. I don't have a, <clears throat> so I, I know from what I used to do, and it's kind of fun seeing, uh, sitting there talking to Mike Petters because we've had a long, um, I'll say, uh, virtual relationship. We've all had this, uh, grown up the same way, is that the front line is the most important. I mean, that's, that's where if they're empowered, uh, they reward you with discretionary effort. And our job, that's why you know, in my, some of my remarks is so heavily weighted towards leadership and accountability. I think the, 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 the speed that we will achieve is not by making better decisions in the Pentagon, but by putting leaders in the right positions, setting the right priorities, and holding people accountable. The opportunity we have in front of us is over the course of the next few years, people will retire. And how we reward and recognize performance sends a clear message to the entire team. How we, how we engage, I'm a big, you know, the, the great thing about getting the uh, NDS finished and a budget built is now I get to go out and spend time, you know, with people in the, uh, in the field. So for example, you know, right over here, we've got the air boss. Right? I mean, how cool is that? So, I mean, to me, you know, it's these um, being able to go out to, you know, different stations and talk about whether the plan the air boss has in place is, you know, flowing down. Are we getting the kind of right effects? The, this is the, like, ultimate management by walking around job. Yes. But, I mean, it's, it's Secretary Mattis says this, uh, it's, it, you know, he says things, you know, I'm writing this book, and the book that I'm writing is really his quotes, not the stuff that I'm learning, <laughs> but he talks about, he says, we don't want command and control, we want command and feedback, and so you, you can't manage from behind a desk, so I've finished this important work, and now it's time to get out from behind the desk and understand through these feedback loops are the things that we said we were going to go do happening. Where they're not happening, you know, where do we take uh, corrective action or, uh, you know, change, change course of direction and then make it so that, you know, we're not so rigid. I mean, uh, we're not going to get everything right, but it's that feedback loop and if we can speed that up, I feel that out there on the front line, people will have confidence. Well, sir, you've got a hard stop uh, today with your schedule, so one, get off the stage. Uh, question before we finish here is just we've obviously got a big industry component in our audience. You've come from industry, you know them, you've got this new mandate. Mm -hmm. What message would you give them or what request would you make today uh, for industry? Yeah, I think the biggest opportunity for us is partnership. Um, I, I, th I think. To me, you know, the, the partnership is, is goes back to this thing around performance. How do we really get at performance? What what good is? I know there's a lot of work that I have to do internally to make it easier to do business with the government. It's a it's a big place. Let me let me, let me think about or make it, maybe make the comment this way. Half of what we do in the Pentagon is buy things. You know, on the, on the services side of the business, we do 1,000 contracts a day. There are 30,000 contracting officers. So it's not as though, you know, with uh, five or six meetings that we're going to kind of just whip the place into shape. But the, uh, the combination of uh, prioritizing 
here in the near, near term doing good business so we can help you to be more stable. I understand how important it is to have stability. Stability is, is crucial. And then, more importantly, longer term, where do we want you to invest? The clearer we can be on where to invest, we know that you're going to invest. It's just we have to be very clear on how we want to integrate those investments and you know, how we want to you know, evolve certain capabilities. So I, I feel in this role there's a real chance to do something great in the sense that we have the best industrial base in the world. The commercial sector is leveraging it more than the Department of Defense, and the Department of Defense needs to move up in its ability to leverage it. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your time today. Great. For your time, uh, FCA and the Naval Institute wanted you to have this book, Great Powers, Grand Strategies, The New Game in the South China Sea uh, by Anders Kaur. has an FCA bookmark, Naval Institute press book, and uh, we wish you the best of luck in your new position which is hugely important to the success of us all. Thank Great. you very much. Okay. <clears throat> all right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. All right, good. good. All right.